Um, I think in your bulletins, Mark 1, if you have a Bible, Mark 1, you know we've been talking about this while. We're going to start today a nine-month journey in the Gospel of Mark. Here's where I want to start. I want you to think about this. What do you think the very first church looked like? Some of us have been around certain types of churches our whole lives, and we think that's what church looked like. You know, it probably had an organ or a steeple or a big band with lights or... What do you think the early church, the very first gathering of Christians, looked like? It was in homes, right? It was in small gatherings. Maybe it was under tents or trees. Um, it was men and women. It was people of different classes. And don't forget, because this is what we forget a lot, especially in the United States. Um, the early church was underground. It was an outside movement. It wasn't like the inside, everyone's Christian in this nation. It was an outside movement, a band of believers, and they were very underground. So they didn't have church bumper stickers, right, that said Hope Community, you know, follow me to church, um, or Christian Fish bumper stickers on their minivans. That was a very, like, underground movement. And they shared meals together. We read this in Acts, right? They prayed together. They shared communion together. And this is the part that I think is really interesting is uh, reading a bunch of church history, and I was very fascinated. What did the first church look like? But they would wrestle with little bits of Scripture, right? They'd, they'd wrestle with little bits of the gospel. So some of you guys came to church today, and I'm going to pick on you. But, like, you know, we have these big Bibles with commentary, and we have highlighters and all these types of things. The way it probably happened at Erica Great Cow is, <laughs> is that, that, that a gospel writer probably shared a bit of it, and I have a bit of this, and I've written this down, or this scribe, and we're going to sit in this group, and we're going to talk about this bit of Scripture each week. And so this is what I want you to think about. Imagine that Mark, a gospel writer, is delivering important bits of the life and message of Jesus Christ to us each week. We don't get the whole thing. Not today. We have the whole thing. But the early church didn't get the whole thing. They got it in pieces. And we're going to piece together this letter for nine months, and it's going to be the most important letter that you've ever read in your life. And we're going to do this till Easter, a bit at a time. And I'm guessing this is probably what it looked like for the early church. So I want to pray for us on this new journey and ask that God would bless it. God, I say this every week, and I deeply believe it today, that if these are just my words or thoughts or ideas, not much will happen. But God, may you speak through me, speak through your word, by your spirit. God, help us be people of the book that love your word wrestle with your word, ask good questions about your word, get confused about your word, and then seek clarity. But may this journey be one where we experience a type of revival, God, in our hearts, in our souls, in our church, in our community, just by looking at bits of Scripture each week. And we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. So today is a little bit of setup Sunday, context Sunday, like syllabus day, when I'm going to tell you kind of what it's going to look like for the next nine months. So it might be more information than normal, but it really is important, everybody, when you read scripture or listen to a sermon, context is key. We take verses sometimes all the time and kind of pluck them because we like them. But there's context to all this. And so a little bit of what I have to do today, which I think is important, is understanding the context of Mark. So most historians believe Mark wrote Mark, which isn't always the case. But this is what's interesting about, about Mark. Mark was a close friend and ministry partner with Paul and Peter. So think about the New Testament and the contribution of Paul and Peter. Mark was a ministry partner and contemporary of those two. Now, his mom was Mary, but there's lots of Marys in the Bible. Um, and it was Mary's house that was one of the early church meetings, church house gatherings. So when you hear some people say, I'm in a house church, that's kind of what these look like. And often women, Mary, were the hosts of these, of these gatherings. Um, and so that was in Mark's house, right? He saw his mom doing that. It was a place that the early church gathered. And a lot of historians actually think that that very house is the place where the Last Supper took place. So Mark's account is not hearsay. Uh, when we read Mark's gospel, he was connected, he was close. And part of what I, um, most people really believe is that the gospel of Mark is a collection of Peter's sermons. How close was Peter to Jesus? Right? They were like this. Um, and so Mark is writing down a lot of what, P, uh, of what 
Peter said, his sermons, his, his lessons, and he put them together uh, in the Gospel of Mark. That Peter is Jesus' closest friend, one of his closest friends, and Mark is writing all those things down. Now, some people ask, which is a great question, what's the difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? If you're really interested in this, I have a very nerdy book in my office I will give to you, but it lays out all the Gospels next to each other of who says what and who doesn't say what about each story in Scripture. But there are differences uh, between the different books. Now, you might know my personality, know why I chose Mark, but it's the shortest of all the Gospels. Uh, it's really fast, and it's like bang, bang. It's, if there's an action Gospel, it's Mark. Um, he uses the word immediately 40 times. I love that word. And next, and next, and look at this. Um, and, and to me, Mark gets just right to the point. And not, that's not always the best, but that's what Mark does. And when I think about, like, if you ask him and I, like, how we, we got engaged, got to know each other, I'd, I'd say, well, we dated for two weeks, we broke up for two years, we got married, some kids came, I buried a ring in the sand, thought I lost it, got in. That's it. And you're like, what? You know. Kim, could you tell us about how you met? And she gave you a little bit more detail. So the way I would explain our engagement is a little bit more like Mark's gospel. <laughs> the gospel of John is like, you know, a little bit more. He's an artist, right? So he's painting with words, and Mark's like, and next, and next, and next. Uh, so you'll, you'll feel that as we walk through this uh, together. And part of it is he skips the birth narrative. Right? Christmas. And you'll see today, he gets right into the baptism and ministry of Jesus. And he's more about actions than words of Jesus. So Mark's going to show us a lot of actions of Jesus, less of the words of Jesus. And Mark was probably written first. Uh, the year 60, 60 AD, uh, is when we believe that this was written. What was he trying to do? What was Mark trying to do of, of the four different Gospels? What was each one are a little bit different. So what was Mark trying to do? This is what you can't forget, which I think is very important and timely. I didn't pick Mark because it's shortest, I promise. I actually picked Mark for this reason. Mark is writing the Gospel with a context of Rome. So think about everything you might know about Rome. But it's seen as the enemy. It's seen as tons of power and oppression. And here's this band of new believers trying to navigate this huge power called Rome. And something had to be done because people were being hurt. The poor were being oppressed um, by Rome. And so something had to be done. A rescue was needed for a long time. And we read that throughout Scripture. So this is the part I love. I'm going to say it twice. This is what I believe Mark wanted to do with his gospel. He wanted to infiltrate the Roman world with the love of Jesus. So think about all the power and the politics and the money and all this stuff. And Mark says, I want to get all up in there with the love of Jesus. And his letter is an attempt to, to wake up Rome. We can be like Rome. All about faster, bigger, better possessions. And it's like, Mark is like smelling salt. If you've ever had smelling salt, you're a little bit dizzy and it gets under your nose. You go, whoop. That's what Mark is trying to do and wake people up. To Jesus. And so my hope for this series is that this church, including the pastor and the pastor's family, would wake up to the love and message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, Mark chapter 1. Here we go. We're going to start. We ain't going to stop until we're done. <laughs> Buckle up. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. So Mark already goes back to the Old Testament. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. So think about it. the city folk went out to the country to hear what this John the Baptist guy had to say. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. My man. <laughs> I want to meet John the Baptist. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he, meaning Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is what's interesting to me. 
Imagine Mark, who has heard hundreds of accounts and things about Jesus from his dear friend Peter, who was best friends with, with Christ. Imagine hearing all those stories and saying, no, we have to let the world know. Where do you start? Have any of you ever tried to write a letter or a song or something to someone? The first words are the hardest. You know, like, how do I start this thing? Starting matters. It sets the trajectory of everything else. So we have to pay deep attention as you guys meet together this week and study Mark. The fact that verse 1 is so loaded and sets the trajectory of everything else. And here are the first words. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And I could do a sermon series on each one of those words and really could take this over four years, but we're not going to do that. So I'm going to walk through the, that first sentence quickly. Beginning, the beginning, those are the first words. He's announcing a new beginning, which God is famous for. So God is always announcing new beginnings. God does new things. God is not stale. This is the continuation of the unfinished story of God. So if you just have the Old Testament, in my opinion, that's the unfinished story of God. And the New Testament is, is the finished story. It's all about the good news of Jesus Christ. So we can get so nitpicky as we study Mark this year, but do not forget it's about the good news of Jesus Christ. And that word, when it says the beginning of the good news, it can be translated good message, good story. Uh, in Old English, uh, it, it's Godspell. You ever heard of the play Godspell, the musical Godspell? And, and that's where we get the word gospel. So when you see good news, think good story, good message, gospel, um, a little bit of a rabbit trail. That word is euangelion. It's where we get the word even evangel or evangelical or evangelicalism that has been based out of that. And I always have to remind people that, that euangelion is not a political party, right? It's not, it's not a strategy. Um, euangelion, uh, uh, that word is people who are shaped by the good news of Jesus. So some people don't like the word evangelical, love the word. If you're referring to someone who is shaped by the message and way of Jesus Christ, then bingo, that's what that word means. And nothing outside of that. It's all about the good news of Jesus. Now, the gospel was a secular term, so Christians didn't come up with the word gospel. And this is what I think is part of the brilliance of, of Mark's letter. Um, it was a secular term. So a gospel message, when someone said they had a gospel or a euangelion, what they were talking about is a history-changing event. So think about a battle or a king. And so someone would stand up on a box and they would announce it, and they would say that this person has a euangelion, a gospel message. But that was a secular term. And then the word Messiah, which means deliver. That's what he says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, Right? A deliverer, son of God. You're going to read all through Mark that Mark loves. They call Jesus the son of God. Now, I'm going to put all these things together. Mark was a student of Roman culture. This is what I believe. Christians, we need to be a student of culture in Wilmington and in our city and in our country. And this is what Mark was. He was a student of Roman culture because this is what he did. The word gospel, which he used, savior, a deliverer, son of God. Do you realize all those terms were used for Caesar? Right? There are political terms. And so when they heard the word gospel, Savior, Son of God, Messiah, they were talking about a man, like a, a, a sinful person who had caused a lot of harm to people. And so he's using those terms. Think about that. That's really interesting. So he uses the same terms for a greater king. Right? And he uses the same terms for a greater kingdom. So he's talking about King Jesus and the kingdom of God, and that is going to cause a rub from here on out. And today, it causes a rub. Because you have lowercase king, lowercase kingdom, uppercase K, king, and kingdom. And those things kind of go like this. And so the coming Christ, the coming of Christ, would be the biggest history-changing event known to man. And so Mark's trying to say, wake up Rome, wake up church, wake up hope community, don't miss this. And as they're walking, you have to remember how controversial this would be. It's a new gospel, right? It's going in the face of what the politics of the day were saying. Um, and it's not going to set well with Rome. So I'm not trying to be funny, but think about this. Like if you were at Chapel Hill, like at UNC campus, and you just put on a Duke jersey and you walk through the middle, 
that's what it would be like, right? Of thinking, wait, this ain't, this doesn't flow, right? I don't think you're one of us. This doesn't work here. And that's almost as you read the whole Gospel of Mark. It's not like, oh, the Christians are here. That's great. You know, they got a T-shirt. It, it was a different movement than that. So this is what's interesting about Mark. So he says that first sentence, which maybe this week, if all you did was dive in on that first sentence, but look where he chooses to go. So instead, instead of the birth narrative of Jesus, Christmas. He makes these massive statements about Jesus, and then he segues to the wild man, John the Baptist. Now, here's what I want us to think about. The good story, the gospel, the good message is not simply to be observed. And some of you grew up in homes where it was like, we just kind of observe this thing, right? It's this religious thing, we kind of observe it. It's not just to be observed. Mark is saying, participate, participate, participate. You were designed to participate in the grand narrative of the creator of the earth. So he didn't, Mark is not writing this letter saying, how can I entertain people in 2022 and keep them really entertained on Sunday mornings? Or a good history lesson, right? Like, like some other historical figures. That's not what Mark is doing. It's an account. He wrote the gospel as an account to the truth of Jesus Christ and an invitation to participate with Jesus, to follow him with every fiber of our being until our last breath. And the gospel message is to always be, until your last breath, received and forwarded, received and forwarded. You don't receive the gospel message once. We keep receiving it, and we keep receiving it, and we keep forwarding it, and we keep living it out in our daily basis. It's not a one-and-done type thing, and you'll see that Mark emphasizes that. But this is why I think he includes in John the Baptist, who's behind Peter, is my second favorite person uh, in Scripture. So this is why Mark includes him right off the bat. Now, John the Baptist, I'm going to tell you quickly about him. So remember, he's Jesus' cousin uh, on his mother's side. He was born just a little bit before Jesus, so about the same age. And it says, this man, so Mark goes, he goes, this man's in the wilderness wearing a camel hair clothing, eating locusts and wild honey. Picture that man just for a second. Maybe what he smells like. I don't know. And I, I what he... When I thought about this, I, I, I went back to this. There were some preschool teachers in our last church that asked me every year to dress up like John the Baptist. <laughs> I took it very seriously. And I wrapped myself in uh, this burlap stuff, and I found these plastic bugs, and I shoved them in my beard. And then I'd come in and say, prepare the way of the Lord, and I'm screaming with these little preschool kids. And one of the kids' names Trip, and his dad and I are really good friends. But Trip was very confused when I kept saying, I'm John the Baptist, and I was eating these bugs, dipping them in honey, and eating these fake plastic bugs. He said, I know who you are. You're not John the Basket. And he sat back down. And so, by the way, anytime I read John the Baptist, I'm like, John the Basket. But this kid would see me in church and just give me the stink eye of like, you're, he'd see me in my robe preaching, you're not John the Basket. So he turned me in to his other classmates. But this character, John the Baptist, is really important that Mark goes right towards him. But why? Why would he go right there at the very beginning? And I think it's this. If a wild man who eats bugs can play a significant role in the kingdom of God, so can you. So can I. It's a great invitation. It's not the high and mighty. It's just these ordinary people who are willing to participate. And so God's master plan, when he needs scripture, what's he trying to do? He's trying to reach the scattered sheep, the people of God who've been scattered for different reasons. And he's trying to reach all of them. And he uses people like John the Baptist, not the most educated not the people with the, you know, a less, you know, fancy backgrounds. He's using all kinds of different people with the greatest message in human history. And John, if you watch him, John lives like salt. Have you ever met someone who lives like salt that makes people thirsty? Right? They live in such a way how they care for their neighbor and they care for others. Not because they say they're a great Christian, but they're actually living out the principles of Jesus and they're like salt and they make other people thirsty that something they want to quench, right? And, and John the Baptist knows that the only person who can quench their thirst, their deep spiritual thirst, is Jesus Christ. So he's always pointing to the one who can quench. So participating in the good story in the gospel is this. We are called to mimic Jesus Christ, right? We are called to, uh, as we mimic him and follow him, think about apprentice. I talked about that last week. As an apprentice follows a master, eventually, guess what you're going to start doing? You're going to start speaking like Jesus, loving like Jesus, serving like Jesus, 
All of those things. That's what it means to participate in God's story. And there's not a soul here today who's not invited to participate uh, in God's story. Now, by the way, if you're a Christ follower, think about this. John the Baptist and some of the early Christians told people who told people who told people who told somebody who told you about Jesus. Isn't that fascinating? Like when I think about like the Sunday school teacher I didn't like growing up, somebody told somebody who told somebody who told her, and did God use that? Absolutely. So if you think about the people who helped you understand Jesus, that comes from the very early church to this day. So our faith is historical in the sense of we are connected to the first church and to someone who eventually told you about the love of Jesus. But before we kind of go further in the story, Mark draws our attention to one more thing that I want you to pay attention to. I didn't put it, if you have your Bibles, you'll see it. I didn't put it in the bulletin. But in verse 9, bug-eating John baptizes Jesus. Last week, if you are here, we had a baptism in the pond. It's just simple. I've been to the Jordan River. It's just simple. Um, but, but John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And this is what God says to Jesus. I want you to hear these words. God says, you are my son, Jesus, whom I love, and with you I'm well pleased. Had Jesus done a miracle yet? Jesus really hadn't done much. And God is expressing his pleasure and love before he did a thing. A little bit of rabbit trail, but some of you have never had a parent, a dad, a mom, say those words to you. And I want you to hear the Father say it today because I believe it. It's true that you are God's son and God's daughter whom he loves, with whom he's well pleased. Not because you have perfect church attendance. Not because you haven't messed up. But because you are his creation that he's made uh, in his own image, right? And, and so why does God want us to hear that right up front? So he wants, here we are, we're going to hear about John the Baptist. And then why is this baptism right up front? And this is why. Do you know what happens next to Jesus right after his baptism? Is he's tempted in the wilderness. Remember, Satan is tempting him in all these ways, and it has to do with his identity of who he is. And Jesus, and God sends him out with, this is who you are, this is who you are. And this is what I want us to pay attention to. Uh, the Father does not want us to forget who we are. Because when you know God's love, that's what can keep your head above water some days. Some of you have experienced in these recent seasons, you're barely keeping your head above the water. But when you remember God's love and faithfulness, that's the thing that for some of us is keeping our nose just above water. And so I feel before Jesus goes off and does anything difficult, this is what God wants him to know. And he wants him to be baptized. And I love that just like Mark was baptized last week, Mark Darrow in that pond, Jesus wants to be baptized as well before he begins his ministry. And so my hope for this series is just like when you think about knowing God's love keeps our nose above water. My hope is for this series is that we would be fully awake to that love. And there's people in your life, you want them to be fully awake to that love the sustaining, life-changing love of Jesus. And my prayer is that there would be revival in your hearts, in your homes, under this tent, whatever that looks like, but that God would breathe new life by his spirit into us. Amen? Okay, I'm going to end really practical, though. He thought I landed the plane. I just went, you? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to land it again real quick. So I'm going to be very, very practical. So as we start the book of Mark, if you don't have a Bible or anything like that, come talk to me. We'll figure out how to do that. But here's a couple things that I think are helpful. The first one is this. And I'm, I'm calling this the Jones Egg Roll Express question. So for most of you, you, go, <laughs> you come to church this way. And you know on the corner is Jones Egg Roll Express. Now my daughters will tell you that as they write home with me at about Jones Egg Roll Express, I say, hey girls, what did you hear today? What did you hear in the scripture? What did you hear from the sermon? If you went back, you know, over there, what did you hear? What did you hear? What did you hear? And now they know if I forget to ask it, they'll start to say, here's what I heard. Here's what I heard. And I'll let the youngest go first because the oldest has a little bit more information generally. And so that's what we do at Chung's Dead World Express. What if you, every Sunday, uh, if you ride with other people, you just know someone's going to say, what did you hear today? Not, did you like the sermon? That's not the question. The question is, what did you hear in God's gospel um, so that is something I just think is helpful. So maybe you do that. If you came to church by yourself, 
you can call me on the way home. And I'll say, what did you hear? Now, be careful when you call me because I know exactly what I said. Um, <laughs> the other one is this. I want to encourage you to be vigilant about claiming time and space to read the Gospel of Mark over the next nine months. Uh, we had these sheets printed. They didn't come in yet. We'll bring them next week. But you can just shove them in your Bible, and it's the text I'll be preaching every week. We put it online. It's on the Instagram link uh, if you want to follow that. But you have to, I really believe, you have to claim a time and space where it's going to get eaten up by other things. We've given you books from N.T. Wright. I have more of those coming in this week. We can get them to you, or you can order them. Some of you have never journaled before, but I think that can be helpful as you read Scripture. What are you thinking? And you write those things down. Some of you maybe have never used text, scripture, to pray. Because sometimes what we pray for is just what's right in front of our face. But if you actually pray based on what you read in scripture, your prayer is going to go this way a little bit. It's going to expand beyond just what's right in front of your face. But scripture can actually help you grow in your prayer life. Get a buddy. Ask someone, hey, let's, hey Nate's been saying, get a buddy, get a buddy, get a buddy. Let's, let's talk about Mark and we should walk together and chat. It could be a neighbor. It could be your spouse. Let's do this together. And then the, the last thing I want to end you with is, as I've really been thinking about this, when it comes to groups forming in our church or people getting together to, to learn God's word, if people only asked one question, I think I'd be okay with it. And this is the question I want to leave with you that I would love for us to always be asking. What are you learning from Jesus? I would love to assume that any of you that call hope your home that I can just say, not in a legalistic way, not in this like, ooh, the pastor's chasing me down. But really, I'm really interested because, you know, sometimes my faith can get dry. And what really helps me is when I say, Erica, what are you learning about Jesus? And she says, here's what I'm learning this season. Whoa, that's helpful. What if we as a church could just easily ask people, what are you learning? And you might say, it's been horrible. I'm not learning the thing. But I need to like, honey, God's, okay, let me pray for you. You know, that's okay. I don't want you to lie. Like, I'm learning, you know, and, don't be all nerdy about it, but be truthful. What are you learning about Jesus? And what if groups caught together and we just assume by serving the poor and reading scripture and loving our neighbor that we're learning something about Jesus? And what if that's the only question we ever asked in a group? That would be a really beautiful community. What are you learning about Jesus? Let me pray for us. God, I want our church to be a group of learners. People with their hands open, not clenched fists, saying, Jesus, teach us, show us. How do we respond? How do we bring the love of Jesus in Rome, in Wilmington, North Carolina? God, help us be apprentices of you, following the master. And God, may we celebrate the fact that you use imperfect people like us all throughout Scripture. That cannot be excuse for us that we don't have it all together because you have a habit of using people who don't have it all together to prepare the way for you, Lord Jesus. So God, walk with us, be with us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.